Welcome in to the PFF NFL Podcast. Steve Palazzolo along with Sam Monson here back on the YouTube channel and back in the studio, Sam, with a little bit better uh, setup here. On Labor Day. Yes, we're laboring. We are Labor laboring on Labor Day. Having said that, the traffic on the way in this morning was glorious. We need more of that. I mean, by that, I mean there was none of it. It's great. I may have averaged a speed that is higher than the permitted speed limit on the roads. We do traffic reports now. Yeah. Do you drive way too fast? I mean, it's all relative, right? Yeah. It's like what's fast in my car is probably unsafe in a slower vehicle. In your Hot Wheels. Yes, in my, my toy. You do have a Hot Wheels. <laughs> I do have a Hot Wheels. You, yeah, you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to talk when you use I talked the cough on mute. button. I talked on mute. Yeah. It's no, all good. I, it turns out I have an actual literal Hot Wheels vehicle. Fantastic. Yeah. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Uh, it is cool. Uh, so today, NFL, NFC preview. Yes. We already did our AFC preview. We did. We're going to keep this tight again. <laughs> as tight as we ever keep it, Steve. Yeah. Um, so there's plenty of in-depth content over at the YouTube channel, of course, profootballfocus.com. Of course, it's fantasy and just general football season. So your PFF Edge and Elite packages are where it's at, especially Elite, man. Premium Stats 2.0 for the first time now in the regular season. That's going to be well worth it, all part of Elite. Yeah, we had the PFF preseason grades. It's the first time you've had those. And now back for the first regular season, you're going to have game-by-game game grades, right? Yeah. Yeah, we didn't have those last year at no. this time. So you get the game-by-game game grades. You get the historical grades. It's all there. All right, let's get in to our NFC preview, just like in the AFC, which is you know on the podcast channel, also on YouTube. Where are we starting? Let's start out west. The west. We're going to work west to east. Of course we are. Right? Let's do it. Because no, because Seahawks fans and 49ers fans and the other west teams, <laughs> they're, always, they're always waiting until the end. Yeah, it's almost, it's, it's, it's almost difficult to determine why they feel slighted. It's sometimes. the Rams and the Cardinals, of course. Um, all right, so let's get into it. So a division that has been owned by the Seattle Seahawks until last year, mm-hmm. the Rams win the division, and it certainly feels like – teams are moving in the diff- in different directions right we have the rams ascending um even though they might not actually have a better record than they did last year by the way kind of an undersold story with how loaded the nfc is the rams might not necessarily improve record wise but be a much better team they're favorites in the nfc though yeah so i mean there's a lot of hype there it's like the patriots are always favorites because they're the patriots in the nfc nobody knows so if you remove the patriots in the equation the Rams are the favorites to win the Super Bowl. That's crazy. What would Neil do if uh, Neil loves Jared Goff, by the way, our PFF founder, Neil Hornsby, mm-hmm. loves Jared Goff. Well, he's just waiting for that Rams Super Bowl win so he can wear the Jared Goff jersey he bought basically he's gonna go. forever. He's going to go. He'll go to that. Yeah, and probably wear his Jared Goff jersey. Oh, I'm sure. We'll, uh, we'll definitely Instagram that thing. Um, so the Rams, but the, you have an ascending 49ers team. I think the Seahawks roster is moving in the in the wrong direction, and then the the Cardinals are kind of in a weird spot where I don't think they have a ton of talent on on the on on their team overall. But I feel like the defense is one of those that always you know plays a little bit better than the uh, the sum of the parts type of thing. Yeah, they are. Or the individual um, parts. Also, the sums better. One caveat to that favorites for the NFC thing, uh, depending on where you look, obviously, <laughs> basically all of the top NFC teams are tied favorites. So the Rams, the Eagles, the Vikings, uh, and who was the other team? What other team are all tied at 10-1 to 1 because Vegas has no freaking idea who's coming out of the NFC either. That sums up the NFC. We're going to get into the, to the division by division, but the key here is that the NFC is completely wide open. Yeah. And it's another one of those instances where, say, like the 49ers could be 6-10 and 10 this year with a pretty good team. Or, you know, the, yeah. the Rams could win 10 games, 9 games. With a pretty good team, and not that much of a difference as far as the talent goes. Or they could win ten games and be nowhere really near the playoff picture. Yeah, that's like another they, one. They could too. win ten games and be out of the playoff picture by week sixteen. Things have flipped since uh, what a few years back, two thousand ten yeah. or so, where they were battling. Was it Seahawks and Rams battling for uh, a seven and nine playoff? Yeah, spot? losing record took the division. All right, let's start with the Rams then. All of these offseason moves mm-hmm. and moves that are. Helping them in the right places. That's, that's the theme, I think, is where are you improving? Are you improving in coverage? Yes. Hakeem Tlaib, Marcus Peters, and their fit in this Wade Phillips scheme. 
that's going to be playing a ton of man coverage. This secondary, because there was a lot of questions. What, what are they going to do in the secondary? Are they going to re-sign LaMarcus Joyner? You have John Johnson at safety, who was one of the better rookie safeties the last, uh, last year. Nikel Roby Coleman's back in the slot. Really good on the back end there. And then, of course, they add Indomitian Sue next to the best player in football, Aaron Donald. You've got some star power. You've got some pass rush. You've got some coverage. Don't forget, when they get to the postseason, they have postseason superstar Troy Hill to deploy in the secondary. So they're really covered for all eventualities. He made it through cuts. Yeah. That was their, he, their top-graded player in their loss to the Falcons last right? year. See, that's what I'm saying. The secondary looks really exciting on paper. Not necessarily the best secondary you're ever going to see, but they they have playmakers. Like Marcus Peters and Aqib Tlaib are legitimate. They have legitimate ball skills in a way a lot of cornerbacks don't. You know, there are there is something to this idea that if you could catch, you'd be playing offense. Um, there are a lot of corners who kind of tick that box who are really good at shutting a guy down, but if the ball ever comes near them, there's a reasonable chance it's just hitting them in the hands and hitting the turf. They're like, they're not catching it. Right. Whereas these guys go get the ball. Like Marcus Peters, we've talked before, does freaky things, ad-libbing to go find the ball. The keep to leave is well capable of kind of turning receiver at the catch point if it's in his vicinity. So that secondary with those two safeties in there as well could be pretty special. Um, but it's probably going to give up some passes as well. Peters and Tlaib, I think, are both prone to the occasional lapse. The front seven is really exciting because there's really no edge presence to speak of, but they might be the only team ever that's never needed one. So it's, it's, it's this, will be, this will be a really interesting test case because we were putting together our pass rush rankings and we had them ranked anywhere. I think they ended up fourth or fifth. And I was like, wait, are they unbalanced enough that they need to be closer to 10th? So you know that Aaron Donald leads the, you know, he led the league in pressures last year by a lot, despite missing two games. And Dominican Sue can push the pocket, but I haven't, I don't think I've ever seen a team, first off, constructed with those types of players, players of that caliber on the interior. But then when you combine it with literally no established edge rush presence, like who, who's there? Who's an established presence off the edge? Nobody. Well, if you add, if you put Sue and Donald together in terms of total pressures last season, they ranked third in the NFL amongst duos. So number one was Joey Bosa and Melvin Ingram, two edge players. Um, this this duo would have, would have ranked third with a pair of interior players. Like that's that doesn't happen. That's absurd. You just don't generate that amount of pressure from inside. So we talked a few years ago about that Jets team when they had a whole stack of interior players, and the question was where are they getting edge rusher edge presence from? And the answer was really nowhere. They just kind of put some of those guys playing outside. It didn't really. That was work. when they had Sheldon Richardson, Muhammad Wilkerson, and Leonard Williams. Yeah. Um, and they still had Damon Harrison there playing nose tackles. So they just had this whole raft of interior players, and their solution was to basically just take some of those guys, move them to the edge, and say, do what you can. The Rams aren't going to do that. They're just going to line these two guys up inside and say, it honestly doesn't matter who's playing outside. Like These two are going to wreck the offensive line so badly that as long as we have bodies outside that can you know, tackle somebody as they walk by them trying to escape the carnage inside, we're going to do pretty well. So like guys like Matt Longacre and Samson Ebucam, they're just going to sit out there and pick up cleanup sacks. Yeah, and, and they're just, probably going to get a decent PFF number. Grades. Yes. Yeah, bad PFF grades, 10 sacks. So it, how about my boy, my boy Justin Lawler? He was a guy that was a PFF favorite, one of those not a great athlete, just, produ- just produces guys, uh, seventh round pick. Last year, so that'll be an interesting case for the Rams. But they're strong in the right places. Then offensively, I think we're just at the point where we just in Sean we trust on offense. Sean McVay, what he did with Kirk Cousins, uh, all the work that we've done on just open throws and how you know how the percentage of open throws that he uh, just creates off of play action is among the league's best. His play action game is spectacular. So it almost doesn't matter. Like Jared Goff last year. Uh, as much as we do like Jared Goff, was a mid-tier to slightly above average quarterback. That's about where he lands. And he was a top five passer rating guy, I believe. Um, so that was one of those cases where you look at the PFF grade, you look at the passer rating, and you say, okay, there's some sort of help there. Yeah. There's some sort of schematic help, yards after the catch help, Todd Gurley going 80 yards on screen pass help, uh, third and 33 screen pass touchdown help against the Giants. I mean, there were all these plays that helped out Jared Goff's numbers. So you just trust that this offense is going to be able to move the ball through the air with Goff throwing to now Brandon Cooks, Robert Woods, Cooper Cup, and then Todd Gurley out of the backfield. 
Yeah, so the question, like the first question is, will that defense be good enough that it doesn't really matter who the quarterback is? You know, the last great Wade Phillips defense back in Denver was so good that a busted, hobbled, not even better than Brock Osweiler that season, Peyton Manning, was able to win the Super Bowl. Yeah. Um, Brock so was way better than him that year during the regular season. Seriously? And, like, look how that's gone since, Brock Osweiler. So that's how bad the quarterback could be and still win a championship given how good the defense was that year. Right. So if the Rams' defense this year is that good, it doesn't really matter how Jared Goff plays. You know, as long as he's not the guy that we saw as a rookie, he's good. If the defense isn't that good, can Goff take another step forward? Because like you said, the numbers were really impressive, but we know that Sean McVay generates a lot of those numbers. The grade last season was 15th in the NFL, which is one spot below Marcus Mariota. It's two spots below Tyrod Taylor. So it's By the fine. Way, the Mariota case, this is like a perfect PFF first stats discussion because Goff's stats could not have been more different than Mariota's. But when you go throw by throw and you factor in supporting cast and all that stuff, that was what made up the yeah, difference. But the guys immediately around Jared Goff on either side, Tyrod Taylor, Marcus Mariota, Andy Dalton, Dak Prescott. So that's the kind of area you're in, yeah. right? Which is fine, but it's not elevating your team to championship levels, right? If you're going to win at that level, other things need to go right, i.e. greatest defense ever kind of deal. But if he can take another step beyond that, can he get better? Can he get up to the Carson Wentz, the Ben Roethlisberger, the Jimmy G area where you are actually elevating your team um, and helping them win plus that boost that you get from the Sean McVay offense? That, I think, is the big question mark on offense. Does Goff have another, another step in him? The glass half full approach here is this is year three. Mm -hmm. This would be he's now the same age that Carson Wentz was his rookie season. Just from an age standpoint, he was a little bit behind. And, you know, if you just expect natural development, which is kind of a, it's player development isn't like Madden where you just get two to three points every single year. But if you're expecting another jump this year, which isn't a crazy ask, then you're getting more out of Goff. You want a quirky uh, age related statistic? Always. It's Carson Wentz related as well. Teddy Bridgewater is one month older than Carson Wentz. Ooh, that's crazy. Mm. Those are fun. Right? Those are fun trying to figure out how old guys are compared to <laughs> – yes, it's, it's fun times. That's the kind of insight no, you get at PFF. Compared, compared to how long they've been in the league. Matthew Stafford, uh, little known fact, still only 23 years old. Yeah, I still don't think that's true. Oh, that's not true. Yeah. I made that one up. Right. All right, how about the 49ers, an ascending team, and here's how I've positioned them. If you looked at their roster a couple of years ago, very, very little talent. Now, not only do you have Jimmy G on offense, but the defensive side of the ball has a star at every level. DeForest Buckner on the defensive line, uh, Reuben Foster at linebacker once he's back from suspension, and Richard Sherman in the secondary, and ascending Akella Witherspoon at corner. It's a roster that is uh, creeping back past average, Sam. It is. Um, it is moving in the right direction. I don't know that it's, um, it's good enough to be able to contend in what we said before was this bloodbath of an NFC. There's so many good teams I can see the 49ers being good, but not great. Um, I, the, there is some talent there, though. The Jimmy G thing is going to be the biggest thing to watch. How good can he be? You know, we saw him play really well last season. One of the most impressive things I saw was that Jaguars game. You know, the, the Jags came in with the league's best defense. Jimmy G pretty much shredded them. Like, yeah, the scheme was great. He was really good. I mean, there's a lot, a lot to like in that game. He pretty much carved them to pieces. If he can do that regularly... I mean, this team can be really good. Like, that's good enough to elevate the competition around you. Um, if he can't, though, uh, that's a big question mark. I don't always believe in, you know, like, how did a team look with this quarterback and then compare it to how they looked with that quarterback. But this was it was kind of an extreme case. They were so incompetent on offense last year with Brian Hoyer or Bobby Hoying. Bobby. Bob, Brian Hoyer and C.J. Beathard. And then Garoppolo comes in and – plays well and they go undefeated all at the same time with the same supporting cast like there's got to be something for that and then you look at this wide receiver core Marquise Goodwin is kind of becoming his go-to guys downfield threat Gar Pierre Garcon as a as a possession guy Trent Taylor's an excellent slot option Dante Pettis I kind of liked coming out of the draft he was their second round pick who has that possession receiver type of feel with some punt return skills I really like the way it's shaping up as far as fitting Garoppolo's skill set as well it's the perfect example of what a good NFL quarterback does to your team now and, more, and how important having one is. Like if you don't have one, almost nothing else matters. And if you do have one, that alone 
can basically transform you into a playoff team. Like this team last season may very well have made the playoffs if they'd done nothing other than put Jimmy G as their quarterback from start to finish. They went from almost winless over the season to a potential playoff side just by putting Jimmy G at quarterback. Like that, it's kind of amazing when you distill it down into that, but that's how important that can be. So, you know, the play of him with his first full season really is key to this whole thing. If he regresses, they're in, not, I don't want to say trouble, they're still in a great position, but they're not going to be making noise within that division. But if he continues the way he's been playing, they could be playoff contenders despite not having as strong a roster as some of these other teams. Can we check in on the three technique situation here? How many have they got now? So we've talked quite a bit about the 49ers and how they, you know, much like the Rams, have zero edge rush presence. You want me they to count them while you're doing this? Well, yeah, you can, you can count them up. They have zero edge rush presence. Um, they're, they're running a traditional 4-3 system, the, the old Seahawks system. Same Seahawks system, the cover three, cover one. We rely on a four-man rush. And they have a whole bunch of similar body types, from DeForest Buckner to Sheldon Day to Eric Armstead to even Solomon Thomas, who is one of their edge defenders, but still plays better on the interior. This will be something to watch. They need to be able to pressure off the edge. I count seven that made the final roster, and that's not counting Contavious Street, who is on the non-football injury list. And they had about 15 in camp. Yes. Just so we know. Yeah. That oh, was that's, our, that's trimmed it down dramatically. That was our story. But so, still, it's enough to make our seven-man, three-tag defense tick. So they've already – oh, yeah, that's, that's a special uh, defense that we concocted. Uh, so they're talking about – Solomon Thomas still needing to rush from the interior. So I can I could see this nickel package with Thomas on the interior and DeForest Buckner on the interior, which is pretty good. That's where Thomas can rush the passer a little bit. Buckner's this ascending player, like I said. So who rushes off the edge? Yeah. Uh, There's really nobody. You stick Ronald Blair out there. Do you stand up Eric Armstead? Earl Mitchell's not going to do it. Cassius Marsh is on the roster. Dakota Watson. I mean, you're really reaching. Really piecing this together for defense. Now, this isn't a blitz. Like Wade Phillips likes to blitz quite a bit. He might be able to to uh, scheme like, some up. They want to rush with four. If you're the 49ers, why would you not pick up somebody like Stephen Means? Right? One of these guys that has clearly shown themselves to be too good for preseason but can't make the Eagles' defensive line roster because it's loaded. Cap Cappy? Yeah. Like, there's a, few, there's a few of these guys who have been preseason stars when it comes to edge rush. Um and for whatever reason, they haven't been given the chance to prove that they can't do it at the next level. Now, if you're a team like the Vikings or the Eagles, you've got a pretty stacked D-line rotation. I get why you, you might not think those guys deserve regular season snaps. But if you're a team like the 49ers and you basically don't have any edge rushers, surely it's worth rolling the dice on somebody like that. Yeah, I think, I think you probably should. We should, uh, we should text our friend Bob, who's yeah, working for them. You tell see. him that. I'll tell him. Steven Means. You, so you have all those Stephen Means numbers because of premium stats, all part of elite, and we could see who the best pass rushers were 15, in the preseason. Fifteen total pressures this this preseason on something like 122 snaps. Uh, talk amongst yourself for a moment, Steve, while I find out how many pass rushes that was. Well, I was going to move on to the Seattle Seahawks. Well, you do that, but I'll, right. I'll get this number for you anyway, just so the people have it because it's so, important. I'm going to move on to the Seahawks. And this is uh, just a different Seahawks team than we're used to seeing. So, obviously, Richard Sherman's gone. We still have Earl Thomas holding out, but he should be back. Yes. 64 pass rushes. 15, 15 pressures. 15 pressures in 64. That's one every four. It's an incredible rate. That's absurd. That's a really good rate. One in every six is really good. Yeah. One in every four, I've never seen that before. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, that's, that's what I would use. I, I don't think the preseason's useful for everything, but I do think seeing guys that stand out at that level – they're worth seeing it's not, what they could do. It's not that it says, if a guy is this absurd in preseason, regardless of who he's doing it against, it's not that it says he will automatically be a Pro Bowl superstar, right? But it's saying this guy is way too good for the level that he was currently pegged at, which is not really on a roster. Yeah, so try him at the regular backups. season level. So yeah, so let's, let's up his level of competition and see what still happens. Like maybe, it'll, maybe he's in this weird sweet spot where he's too good for backups but not good enough to actually be on a field in the regular season. Or maybe he is, and you just haven't given him the shot yet. All anyway, right, Seahawks. Now we go to the Seahawks? Yeah. Uh, so just a whole bunch of uh, different names. And I don't think the Seahawks are going to be bad, necessarily. They can't be bad because they have Russell Wilson at quarterback. Well, yeah, that was the thing I was going to get to. Russell Wilson saves a lot. But let's start on the defensive side of the ball. Sherman's gone. Yep. Shaquille Griffin takes over as that number one corner. The number two cornerback spot 
I mean, we're talking Nico Thorpe, rookie Trey Flowers, Dante Johnson. There's not a lot of names there at the number two spot. So that's a question mark. Justin Coleman, solid in the slot. Uh, you, Cam Chancellor is retired. You get Bradley McDougal taken over for him. We'll expect Earl Thomas back at some point. Will we? Maybe. I will be. Okay. You still have stars at linebacker Bobby Wagner and K.J. Wright when he's healthy. But then the pass rush as well. The pass rush took a step back last year, as did the rest of the team, overall from a record standpoint. Michael Bennett's gone. Cliff Averill's gone. So you're relying on Frank Clark, who has some pretty good production in his career, and then a whole bunch of more question marks. Can Deion Jordan replicate what he did last year? Rasheem Green's a rookie third rounder. Quentin Jefferson. I mean, who's rushing the passer and who's covering on the back end? These, are, these aren't questions that Seattle has had to ask over the last five or six years. If you didn't know that this was the Seattle Seahawks roster and you took a look at that just in terms of personnel, you know, from a, like yeah. a, a white label kind of deal, you would look at that and say that is a bottom 10 roster in the NFL. But because it's a Seahawks, I'm talking myself into they're all going to develop. Kind of, yeah. the Seahawks. And because they have Russell Wilson, you know that to some extent it won't really matter. Yeah, I'm trying to skew positive for, all, for everyone here. Okay. The NFC podcast is going to be very positive because every team has hope. In the Here's NFC. the thing. They're not going to be terrible because they have Russell Wilson, a quarterback. And it's important, I think, to, for people to understand just how good he is because I don't think he gets enough credit for that sometimes. He's been working behind arguably the worst offensive line in the NFL essentially since he's been in the league. So let's say that over that span, it's been the worst offensive line in the league, even if in other seasons, teams have been worse, right? Sure. He is under pressure, something in the region of 40% of his dropbacks consistently. That's about the line at which quarterbacks tend to go to crap. Some of it, some of which is his own I'm doing. getting there. I'm getting there. Okay. Sorry. Fair some enough. of that is is definitely his own doing, right? He is... He has a, a tendency to bail from a clean pocket. He has, he's, he's comfortable running around behind the line of scrimmage, whether yes. it's advised or not. For sure. So some of that is his own doing. But he has had one of the worst situations when it comes to pass protection um, and that kind of stuff in the league since he's got here. Now, he has had a really good defense to back him up on the other side of the ball. But a lot of times the receivers haven't been fantastic. It's been Doug Baldwin and a bunch of other guys that have rotated through. Um, for a while, he had Marshawn Lynch kind of dealing with the running back equivalent of the same problem. I, the offensive line is terrible. It's not me opening up any holes. I'm going to have to break 100 tackles right. in a season if I'm going to be successful here. So the two of those guys were kind of working in tandem to overcome this disaster that was around them for the entire time. And he has just graded consistently really, really well every single season despite that. Um, I, I just don't think he gets enough credit for that. But at some point, given how good the NFC is, it's just not going to be enough to live with teams like the Rams, the Vikings, the Eagles, et cetera. And yeah, this is probably the year. It might look like last year. I mean, they stay in enough games. He had this ridiculous fourth quarter magic last year, which is tough to duplicate But uh, because he, he had a lot of games where it wasn't great the first three quarters and then just you know bailed them out. That's kind of a Russell Wilson MO. He's also a weird quarterback. There's so many times if you're just looking at it from a traditional quarterback lens you're like man he missed a read there missed a read there missed a read there but ultimately when you when you add up all the plays at the end of the season he's a top five top eight quarterback every year no matter what um so I'm expecting more of the same but you talked about the receivers we have a banged up Doug Baldwin that's a concern because when he's healthy he's awesome banged up Doug Baldwin with Tyler Lockett Jerron Brown old Brandon Marshall I mean he's still Jimmy Graham's gone at tight end you get Nick Vanette Will Disley who's a blocking tight end I mean, playmakers are a major question mark here. Now, call me crazy. I think the O-line's going to be a little bit better overall this year. Full season of Dwayne Brown. Justin Britt, still pretty solid at center. Ethan, Ethan Pochich, I'm kind of projecting him to live up to his draft hype and our college grade, which was solid. Even at guard? Even at guard. Okay. But then there's DJ Fluker and Jermaine Effetti. There's your problem. On the edge. Effetti was a little bit better in pass pro last year. So I'm just saying they could be less disastrous plus a new scheme i'm kind of banking on maybe new scheme new coach new 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 everything might well, help a little bit at least they're probably going to stop trying to convert defensive linemen and basketball players to line no jr sweezy's back well yeah but i'm telling I, you you take joey hunt the little undersized center you put him at center justin Britt back to guard and get fluker out of the lineup and that's your best that's your best lineup for seattle but Britt was terrible at guard I know, but I, maybe I think you just bank on the fact that he his progression wasn't just because he moved to center. It was because he also just got 
you know, more experience, more time in the league. I mean, did he even get good? He just had a few games that threatened like he might actually be a really good center and then went back to being moderately crappy. Better. He's been better. Well, yeah, but that's because he was terrible to begin with. Do you have low hopes for Seattle this year? Um, I, I think they'll be – they'll win some games. They'll, th- they'll be in and around 500, but they won't be threatening – I don't think they'll be threatening the contenders, and they may not like even be in the playoff running late in the season. Yeah, it's, it's just a tough year with, with the NFC loaded. I think it's going to be a tough year for the Arizona Cardinals as well. Uh, interesting quarterback situation. Uh, my, my defense of Sam Bradford for his entire career – knowing he's got some limitations. I would love to see him with just great playmakers, great offensive line. I feel like he could be that. You just you mentioned all the mid-tier quarterbacks before, right? Goff and Dalton and Tyrod. And you put him in the right situation, I think he'd, he'd have that nice statistical season. Arizona's not the place for that right now. We've got old Larry Fitzgerald. Christian Kirk looked pretty good in the preseason. Chad Williams, big question mark there. Offensive line, big question marks. Although even, I think... They look like they'll be a little bit better this year as well. One final note on the uh, Russell Wilson thing, which is it took me a while to lo- look this up. This is how this, this podcast is going to go. You're going to talk. I'm going to look some stuff up, and then we'll hit people back with the Don't data later. Don't tell people the secret here. Sorry. I mean, through the magic of podcasts, uh, we, we're now able to do kind of multiple year grades. You know, look back over a few seasons and tot it all up together, and instead of giving you single seasons every single year, I'm able to tell you how well a guy's played over a run. That's what you got. So for the past four seasons – I chose four arbitrarily. Turn it to me so I could see it. Arbitrarily because basically that was the filter already in. Uh, Russell Wilson is the number six graded quarterback over the past four seasons. So Tom Brady, number one, makes sense. Drew Brees, Matt Ryan, Aaron Rodgers, Ben Roethlisberger, the guys you expect. Russell Wilson's right up there with those guys. Yeah, that sounds right. He's been good. Yeah. So that's way better than anybody else you care to name. You know, whether it's uh, whether it's even Jimmy Garoppolo this this short run, whether it's uh, Carson Wentz, whether it's uh, Carson Palmer when he had his phenomenal MVP season, Cam Newton, Dak Prescott, et cetera, et cetera. Russell Wilson is right up there with the top guys over any kind of extended period of time. Now you ready? Yeah, now we can go to the Cardinals again. I'm waiting for Sam Bradford's breakout season. That was the gist of my comments before. When does Josh Rosen take over, more importantly? Uh, well, it's going to be as soon as Sam Bradford is broken, which is probably going to happen quite quickly. By week two? Yeah, well, I mean, that's been his sort of M.O. recently, right? One great, one great game to start the season. He made then... it through all of 2015 and 16. I think he made it through all of 2015, didn't he? With the Eagles? Yeah. 2015 and 16. He but may have missed he... a little bit of 2015 time. Didn't he then, like, break himself twice? Like, Last almost... year. He didn't do it the year before? No, 2016. He had a full season with Minnesota. Full season? He missed the first game because no he got traded. Happened. There's no way Sam Bradford has ever it made it It was a 15-game season. Game season for him. <laughs> because Sean Hill had to start week one because they traded him before week one. Ah, uh, it's true. And then yeah. week two, he had that spectacular game against yeah, Green yeah. Bay. Last year, week one, spectacular game against the Saints. And then He's broke. just tantalizing enough, you know? What was amazing about that game is that, like, he didn't even appear to get injured in the game. He just came out of it after a spectacular yeah. game. It's like, oh, by the way, Sam Bradford's broken. That was last year, week one, has this great game. Nobody's even thinking that he got hurt, and all of a sudden he's on the injury report, and it's like, will he play Monday night against the Bears? Yeah, and then, oh, by the way, this might linger a while. And then they rushed him out quickly because it seemed like that was getting absurd. <laughs> and he could barely move. The Bears blitzed the heck out of him for the couldn't, season. couldn't move. That was one of the most depressing the sights I've ever seen, was him trying to avoid death in the pocket behind an offensive line that couldn't block the Bears. It's hard enough for him with two legs, never I mean, mind that was, one. That was horrible. So, yeah, Sam Bradford will hang in there for a while. That offensive line in Arizona is going to be interesting because from a run-blocking point of view, it might be really good. From a pass-blocking point of view, not so much, but it might not be terrible, which is what we keep talking about, right? You don't need to be awful, you do, or you don't need to be great. You just need to not be awful. Yeah, like the two guards, Mike Upati, Justin Pugh, when both of those guys are healthy and on the field, Pugh showed some of the signs in this preseason. They could work well together. David Johnson back healthy. So interesting run game. And, uh, you know, fantasy fans, excited to hear that with David Johnson. And then, again, the defense, I think it's lacking star power. you get got Chandler Jones who can get after the quarterback, and then you get Patrick Peterson. You've got stars. I'm sorry, they have stars. It's lacking depth. they got a couple stars. It's lacking depth. Marcus Golden, can he bounce back and be that pass rusher opposite Chandler Jones, Buda Baker, maybe an emerging star. But it's one of those weird teams, like I said, that always seems to be 
uh, as a team. I know it's a whole new coaching staff and all that stuff. They, you know, the sum of their parts sometimes a little bit better. Is it time to give up on Robert Kendiche already? Yeah, it hasn't been great. Mike it, didn't love him. It's too early though. It's year three. He's only played twenty three snaps this preseason, and they weren't good. Snaps. It's a year three. Yeah. So too early. That's no. Kind of seems like the time you should know something. He's still young. Okay. Is that still working? Is that working? Um, well, I mean, it's a line. I'm not sure anybody's buying it, but sure. What are your thoughts on Arizona? Are they are they the worst team in the NFC? The worst team in the NFC. Uh, hmm. I could buy that. There you go. No, well, they're one of the worst. I could see, I could see the Giants being worse. Oh, we'll get there. Yeah. We'll get there. But that's it, right? It's those two. All oh. right, north or south? Where do you want to go? You tell me. You're the guy with the you're the guy with the compass in this crazy directional north trick. It is. We're giving a lot of time to the divisions here. We're on pace for a for a marathon here. Can oh, yeah. we can we move quickly? I keep telling you this. You're the guy in the hosting chair. You control the time. Moving on to the NFC North. See? The Green Bay Packers, they're strong in the right places. Aaron Rodgers is back. They've got more cornerback help. Now let's talk about the next team in the NFC North, the Bears. Smooth. Is that quick enough? Best, uh, best division in football? Does the Khalil – so I wouldn't have said this a week ago, but does the Khalil Mack trade yes. essentially make that happen? Because it, it was like Packers and Vikings, and then you know the Bears and the Lions will be feisty. Mm-hmm. Are the Bears elevated up into that Packers-Vikings uh, discussion? Yes. I mean, short of Mitchell Trubisky being disastrous, this Chicago team should be good. They have one of the more interesting schemes in the NFL, which is right up there with Doug Peterson and Sean McVay in terms of manufacturing stuff for their quarterbacks, right? These RPOs, run-pass options. The Eagles and the Chiefs last season, and Matt Nagy came from the Chiefs um, offense. So that's, that's what they're running here. They tied for the league lead in um, percentage of plays that utilized RPOs. So 17% of the plays they ran had RPOs as part of the, the deal. We're going to see some of that same stuff in Chicago. And the long and the short of it is RPOs manufacture free yardage. They have a much higher average uh, per play than any other type of play. Um, when you run from RPOs, you average more because of that threat. When you pass from RPOs, you, you just generate this free yardage. The completion percentage is absurd. It's 80-something percent. Right. Because you're, just, you're only taking the pass when it's there. Right, you're only taking the pass when it's wide open. It's free. It's Generally it's, shorter passes, yeah, but it's, it's just it's, it's just something efficient. that's it's something that's been dictated by the fact that the defense isn't covering it. Therefore, it's basically pitch and catch. It should be open. It's so, important in the NFL because it's just hidden yardage. It's free yardage that you're able to take <laughs> schematically. That's where our, RPOs aren't going to win. You're not going to run 80 of them in a game, but it's it's you know in a in a game of 70 plays, five free plays here and two more free plays there help. It's what it is. It's it's adding a layer of um, – it's adding a boost to your quarterback's efficiency, right? Yep. You're, you're expecting him to do all the stuff you need him to do anyway, but on top of that, you're going to give him 10% extra be, by, by these RPOs just by doing all this stuff that puts the defense in a bind. So that will help Mitchell Trubisky this year, right? What else will help him is all of the free agent and draft additions they made to that offense. Anthony Miller, um, Allen Robinson, Trey Burton. Taylor uh, Gabriel. Taylor Gabriel. All so, battling for time. Gabriel and Miller. I mean, Kevin White's still on the roster. Barely. Ready somewhere. ready to break out. So this team has gone from having the worst receiving core in the league, or maybe the worst with Baltimore, to actually having a pretty good-looking unit. Yeah. Right? Um, the offensive line should be okay. There's still a couple of question marks there, but when we talk about just get to solid, they should be solid across yeah. the board. The defense, though was already heading in the right direction. They draft Roquan Smith, who could be a special player, and could be special early because he's good at the stuff that rookies typically tend to take a while to get, this coverage ability, this understanding of how route concepts develop behind him, zones, all that kind of stuff. But now you finally fix your edge rushing problem. They haven't been able to find a consistent edge rusher for years. Leonard Floyd is the latest example of a guy that hasn't been able to live up to that. And now you get a guy you know is a top five defender in the NFL. Um, one of the top three, two edge rushers in the league. He's the best player on your defense immediately. And that's gonna, that just kickstarts. It catalyzes that entire defense 
um, and takes them to a different place. Yeah, so I mentioned this on our YouTube Khalil Mack video. We spent so much time talking about the Bears offseason from an offensive standpoint. Their defense, they were in a place that could have become disastrous this offseason if they didn't re-sign Prince of Mukamara. Yeah, their whole Kyle secondary. Fuller. Yeah, up. their entire secondary, right? Now they've got this kind of up-and-coming secondary. You mentioned the playmaker in Roquan Smith in the middle, but you can only do some, so much in an offseason, right? At some point, you're like, man, we really wanted to address the offensive line, or we really wanted more receivers, and you just didn't get to it. The Bears probably really wanted to upgrade their edge rush situation. It, it, there's only so many resources to go around, and all of a sudden it's like September 1st, oh, wait, we're going to add Khalil Mack to what could have been one of the biggest weaknesses on the so team. So who won the Khalil Mack trade? Somebody has to win, Steve. That's the rules. I don't think it's as disastrous for the Raiders as people are making it out to be. You're out of your mind. So I would say, um, I'm, look, the Bears are in a good spot because of that trade. They're in a really good spot because of the trade. So if you have to put a winner on it, I'd say the Bears. But the media reaction to this, that the Raiders are just a bunch of idiots and that they got fleeced and that like they're done, I'm not buying into that completely. I don't think it's a disastrous trade for the Raiders. This trade reminds me a lot of the uh, Jared Allen trade for the Vikings a decade ago. Yeah. Where, for the same reasons, the Vikings couldn't find edge rushers for years. They kept drafting first rounders and they all sucked. Kenechi Daisy, um, Erasmus James, they just kept swinging and missing on these guys. So eventually they went, you know what, screw it. We're just going to send a giant haul of picks and money to the Chiefs for Jared Allen because we know this guy is good. And we're, it means we can stop searching. So they they traded what was before this trade, I think, the biggest haul of picks ever for a defensive player. They got Jared Allen, who was in the final year of his contract. Again, same kind of idea. They then had to immediately hand him the richest contract ever for a defensive end, and it worked out perfectly. He answered all those problems. He averaged something like 85 pressures a season for the Vikings, um, became one of the best edge rushers in the league, and it worked out for them. So How did it work out for the Chiefs? I mean, all right. They got Jamal Charles with one of those picks, I believe. Um, the rest of them I don't think they did a particularly good job with. But it's, it's almost I, – I always like to think that those are independent of the trade. Yeah, I, I you don't got really the care picks. About, yeah. It's then up to you what you do with them. Yeah, I right? don't care about the selections necessarily. I mean, obviously the selections matter, but – uh, look, I, I don't think it was a disastrous move for the Raiders. It I'll made more it sense for the Chiefs because Jared Allen, I think, had already had a DUI. He was like one more incident away from getting suspended for a year. So there was enough about Jared Allen to make the Chiefs skittish about handing him that richest ever contract. There's none of that with Khalil Mack. Like, he is the perfect, the perfect player. He's got no off-field concerns. He's been a team lead, you know, all this stuff. There's no concerns about handing him the money other than handing him the money. So that part's weird because they, the Raiders have the money. I thought when you looked at how bad their roster was around 2013 and the fact that they could get Khalil Mack and Derek Carr in the same draft, that, should have, that was a franchise-changing draft. Now, it wasn't for long. I mean, it kind of is, but you, you, you could have built around those guys for 10 years, yeah. right? And you would have pointed back to 2014 was the time that you got a star on defense, you got, you got your quarterback of the future. I mean, my logic with all yeah. this is, you basically spend your entire time with talent acquisition trying to find a Khalil Mack. Once you get one, what's, like, what's the point in getting one if you're then going to send him away because you have to pay him some money? Well, I, so lo let's look at a big picture. Now we're going to take forever. Look at a big picture Too real quick. quick. You'll be, you'll if, you can, if you can draft a guy in the first round, you hit on him, you get four years of first round pr uh, production at a market level, and then you don't pay him the big money, and you get two first round picks in exchange. And now... Granted, you might not hit on Khalil Mack again. That's fine. But you can hit on two guys. No, because nobody's good enough at drafting to, to execute that strategy. No, because just the, the more picks, but it's all part of just all the more picks you, you have, have, the more you have. Unless you have 25 draft picks a season, nobody is good enough at drafting to like execute Alabama that strategy. Like Alabama recruiting. Yeah. Alabama can recruit I mean, 25 so first rounders. That would be the only way of getting that done, right? Is to basically say, okay, we're going to operate almost like a minor league system. We're going to build through the draft entirely. We're going to execute solely based off rookie contract value. And then as soon as money comes into the equation, we're getting rid of these guys. But in order to do that, you have to have a strike rate good enough in the draft to be competitive based off first contract players and almost nothing else. But part of the reason why, and this is the stuff George and Eric are talking about all the time, nobody's actually good at drafting. Exactly. And nobody's actually bad, terrible solution. but nobody's actually bad at drafting either. But nobody's good enough to exist solely off the draft. So you get more picks. 
So if you do have to, so you so you don't spend a ton of money, but on just one play, you can't spend that much money on one. Look, we were sitting here a couple years can. ago, but we were sitting here a couple years ago saying you can't pay and Sue all that money. Miami Dolphins. Sue wasn't that good. He's not as he good as Mac, good, but he's still but he's really good. Not as good as Mac or Donald. I'm just saying it's not disastrous. That's all. Like, that's my defense. There's a certain level of player that I would have liked to lock him up. That if is I'm too good to let walk out the building. And Khalil Mack is that caliber of player. I don't think Sue was. So the Bears are competing. Yeah. In the NFC North with the Vikings and with the Packers. Uh, is it too early to be too excited about the Packers because they're my Super Bowl pick every year, Sam? Yes. You know, because Aaron Rodgers at the helm, it, you know, that the end. that matters a, a lot. Yeah, that's the extent of your logic there. The issue the last couple of years has been disastrous play in the secondary. But now you've got this influx of youth and Tremont Williams. You have Tremont Williams <laughs> who just keeps play, Williams. who just keeps playing well, right? Yeah. Tremont Williams and a combination of J.R. Alexander, Kevin King, and our boy Josh Jackson. I mean, really, Josh Jackson and J.R. Alexander, were, they were, what, two and three on our draft board? Yeah. Among cornerbacks with Denzel Ward mm-hmm. right up there. And they both went to the Packers. There was one and four, whatever it was. They were, they were first-round picks in our minds. They got two of them. Mm-hmm. Josh Jackson showing off his playmaking skills in the preseason. When we talk about getting better in the right places, getting Aaron Rodgers back at quarterback and getting this influx of youth at cornerback is pretty good. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see how much Josh Jackson plays because he was he's fairly low down on that depth chart as a second round pick. They've got guys like Kevin King who he needs to beat out for playing time. Um, Tremont Williams, like you mentioned, the ageless old veteran coming back, he looks like he'll start. And Jair Alexander will be ahead of him because one, he's the first round pick, and two, because he'll play in the slot. So there's an easier path to him to get on the field right away. So. I think we already know that Josh Jackson is going to be a really exciting, talented player. It's just a case of how long it takes the Packers to realize that and get him on the field. He was also a late bloomer at Iowa. Yeah, well, not so much a late bloomer. He's just barely – they didn't have him as corner to begin with. Yeah. So basically as soon as he's played corner, he's been fantastic. The other ripple effect of this Khalil Mack thing is what it does to the Packers and the Vikings in terms of their chances because do they have people that can block him? Like, the Packers have Bakhtiari, but he can't play both sides of the line at once. A healthy Brian Bulaga. Can't block Khalil Mack. Can do a reasonable job. No. Khalil Mack. I love Khalil Mack. Let me, let me just not take this away from him. But there was a, every time the Khalil Mack versus Vaughn Miller debate would come up in our mentions, uh-huh. you'd hear Broncos fans being like, well, Khalil Mack got to play against the Broncos a couple times a year. Yeah, which is fair. Which is actually a fair point. He uh-huh. doesn't get that anymore. He doesn't get the Donald Stevenson treatment. No. Any longer? No, it's legitimate. I mean, he didn't have, he didn't get the boost of gets, going up against Denver's tackles twice. Gets a year. the Vikings twice. He does. He gets the Vikings twice. But like Brian, Brian Belaga is a pretty good right tackle. But you're going to need to be better than a pretty good right tackle to stop Khalil Mack from Van Jackson. Your game plan? No, I get it. Uh, so Green Bay, Bakhtiari at left tackle. Got some question marks on the interior, I'd say. But you got Aaron Rodgers. You got Jimmy Graham now there with Devontae Adams, Randall Cobb. They're rolling 12 deep or whatever in wide receiver. They had to keep all those young guys that they drafted. Mm-hmm. I just like the way this roster is being they, uh, constructed. They kept Kumaro, preseason superstar. They did, along with their three draft picks. How many? They got eight wide receivers on their roster. New England has like three. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Or at least for a while they had three. So it's fun. They somehow have four tight ends as well. <laughs> Jimmy Graham, Lance Kendricks, Mercedes Lewis. you got to have weapons to play with. So – the Packers, I think, are in reasonable shape, and obviously Aaron Rodgers is a superstar. But the Vikings are the team that I think are really the ones that suffer from the Khalil Mack thing because they don't have anybody that can block him. I mean, you think this is legitimately going to turn the tide when the Bears play the Vikings twice per year? Yeah. One player, Khalil Mack, is going to take the Vikings, who would be favored in these games. Mm-hmm. And because Khalil Mack can absolutely destroy, say, Rashad Hill – or rookie Brian O'Neill, whoever they tried out there, they kick Mike Remmers out to right tackle, whoever's out there, Khalil Mack can destroy them that badly. Yeah. I mean, we've seen, it's not like this is, <laughs> I'm not like I'm breaking unprecedented news here. You have seen in b- countless times in the past that if you have a colossal mismatch between offensive linemen, particularly a tackle, and defensive linemen, that can destroy an entire game. Think back to the Super Bowl between the Panthers and and the Broncos with Mike Remmers. Mike Von Miller going up against Mike Remmers basically decided that Super Bowl. The Panthers could not block um, Von Miller all game, and that was all she wrote. The Vikings have the same situation. Now, Khalil Mack may not be quite the pass rusher that Von Miller is, but he's right there. And 
every, anybody the Vikings have on that offensive line at tackle is essentially a Mike Remmers or equivalent, whether it's Rashad Hill, whether it's Brian O'Neill, whether it's Mike Remmers himself. Like at left tackle, they're relying on Riley Reef bouncing back because he had a really pretty bad season a year ago. He can't block him either if he, he lines up on that side. Riley Reef is supposed to be the epitome of the average player. And he was. Which is valuable. How many times have we said that's valuable? Yeah. Just this average left tackle. If he does get back to that, there's value there. Yeah. I mean, him... If he goes back to being an average tackle, he will lose moderately to Khalil Mack. And you can get by that. You can, you can escape with moderate ass-kicking. You cannot escape with complete and total uh, abject misery, which is what will happen on the other side. On the other hand, they invested a ton of money in Kirk Cousins. who will be on so the floor that, a lot. So that Khalil Mack can attack him, not from the blind side, probably from the front side. So he'll be able to at least see him, Sam. Except well, that's, when you can't. That's going to make him feel a lot better. When Except when you read see, the field to your left and there's no the blind side. When right you there. can see the 275 pound guy steaming towards you, that's that's going to really help. It's going to help the hurt wash right away. You can't really see him though. You can't. It's all blind side. The okay. entire pocket's blind sided. But Cousins thrown to Adam Thielen and Stephon Diggs with a little bit more aggressiveness. And my boy Dalvin Cook, I really think Dalvin is ready to break out, even coming off the injury. This could be an explosive offense. Does the defense take a bit of a step back? Uh, you know, just it's one of those. It's just so tough to maintain consistent uh, defensive effort year in year out. You take a guy like you know Brian Robinson's out, and Denell Hunter's got to play a few more snaps, and Everson Griffin. It's just you. You just start to lose a little bit of depth every year, and that this feels is, like where they are. This is kind of what Mike Zimmer's always done: is just consistently crafted these good defenses. I actually think he's kind of overachieved in Minnesota compared with what he did in Cincinnati. Maybe the uh, the talent acquisition has been a little bit better. But it's the same kind of few question marks that keep servicing for the Vikings is can they patch up that secondary? You know, they've relied on uh, Terrence Newman for years, just somehow defying age and still playing really well. He's retired this just before the season, immediately gone straight to the coaching staff. Um, So you're back to Xavier Rhodes, one side, Trey Wayne's the other side. Now you've got Mike Hughes, the first round rookie, essentially having to be your starting slot corner right from the get go. Anytime you're relying on a rookie defensive back in year one, it's at least a question. You don't know exactly how that's going to go. After that, you're down to Mackenzie Alexander. Houghton Hill, the undrafted rookie, is somehow in the mix for the Vikings. So You didn't love him. Did not. There is uh, there's just question marks again in that secondary. But they could be doing more interesting things. This signing of George Iloka could be fascinating. They've been talking about kind of big nickel, three safety packages to deploy him. Uh, Harrison Smith and Andrew Sandejo all in the field at the same time and kind of mitigate some of these matchup weapons on offense, these tight ends. I love kind of intrigued to see the that. The Jimmy Graham yeah. kryptonite. I mean, look, I'm all for all that. I'm all for that stuff. In, in, a, in, a, in an NFL world right now where somehow some, some pretty ver- versatile safeties, without getting into the political issues, some pretty versatile safeties took a while to get signed, I, I would be jumping all over these guys as specialists, just specializing these guys. Particularly, I mean, Iloka is getting paid like nothing. He's yeah. on the veteran minimum, I think, for a year because he wanted to play with Zimmer. Like, that is a steal. And, you know, this idea, like, teams like the Bears are going to run a lot of two tight end sets. If you're running two tight end sets and you can deploy three safeties to cover that with... You need to. Adam Shaheen, like, Trey Burton. Yeah, with, like, a guy like Iloka and Harrison Smith, both of whom can cover the slot relatively well and move to a bunch of different places, that could be fun. All right, let's go to the Detroit Lions to round out the NFC North. Uh, Matthew Stafford, you know, we put him at number 10 in our preseason quarterback rankings. Why do you hate him so much? Steve? We hate Matthew Stafford. Led the league in dropped interceptions last year. I'll say the same thing about Stafford. When he's on top three quarterback, awesome. So fun to watch. Happens three or four times a year, tops. Still looking for the uh, fountain of consistency. That's what he's fountain looking for. Fountain of consistency. Yeah, he was a shrug emoji. Are there Honestly. many people looking for that, or is it just you? The, the, yeah, I think Stafford. I've never heard of anybody Stafford, searching for that particular Dalton, fountain. Stafford and Dalton. The coasters. Oh, I the, see. the roller coasters. So guys. they're looking for the fountain rather than you. I'm not looking for it. Oh, okay. Matthew Stafford's looking I for it. I thought like you were searching for it you know, on their behalf. It's like this never ending. How do you get. Like the word consistency is a, a weird one in general. It usually just means you're good, good or not good. But, but the top, how do you get Stafford to play that top end game? a little bit more often. But he's got these nice playmakers, Golden Tate, Marvin Jones. Uh, Kenny Galladay has done some nice stuff out there. Uh, I don't think this roster matches up with the rest of the NFC, NFC North, though. No, I mean, I think they're, they're, they're probably going to be solid, right? 
but Solid just doesn't cut it in, t- in the NFC heading into 2018. Oh, so they're another team. Like uh, like I said, they're, they're yes, they're solid. They could be a good team. But that who, could be five wins. Yeah, they could be a good team that props up the bottom of their division with five wins. Okay, so here's, but we're going to be positive here because we, we're going to give everybody hope. So, okay. you know, Ziggy Ants is going to bounce back off the edge and be their top edge rusher. Anthony Zettel will build off of last year's very encouraging year. Jared Davis will take the step forward. He's very good against the run. I've seen him do some nice things in coverage. He'll take that step forward. Darius Slay is one of the best corners in the entire NFL. Still wondering, you know, is it Devin Lawson opposite him? Jalen Tease Tabor, is he going to, you know, take the job, the second rounder from 2017? So there's there's some things to like there. But the big offseason story in Detroit, much like it is in Seattle, we didn't touch on it, but it's the establishment of the run game. Yes. They want to establish the run, adding in LeGarrette Blunt, drafting Carryon Johnson, drafting – Frank Rag now. We're going we're gonna to get better running the ball, and we're going to get better defending the run because that's how you win in the NFL in 1985. I mean, there is this with, – with the guys like Stafford and maybe Eli Manning, there is this element of there's been multiple years of so much pressure on those guys yeah. in this pass-first offense. So if nothing else, we're going to answer the question of what happens if you do give Matthew Stafford a solid run game to you know, play off the back of. I think there's clearly, still there's still I, enough questions on the O line though. I think a lot of the the past couple of years has been like it's been a genuine conscious decision. Like we're not going to dedicate a huge amount of resource to the run game because we just gave the quarterback a giant boat ton of money, and if we're doing that, he should probably be carrying the offense. So we're not like we're not building this we're not building this pounding dominant run game so that any old tool can play behind it because otherwise why would we pay this guy all the money? So this year, at least, we're going to get the answer to that question. Does he become this phenomenal quarterback if he suddenly has a platform to play behind? Or maybe they didn't have a running game. They passed, they passed it a ton the last couple of years. They put the pressure on Matthew Stafford. And that's why when I looked at their roster the last couple of years, they weren't that good, but they overachieved and won a lot more games than they should have mm-hmm. because they passed the ball. Yeah. I mean, that's... That, right. One of the arguments surrounding that is, yes, it was a conscious decision, and to an extent it worked. So like it's not this flaw. It's not the reason they're held back. It's the reason they're as good as they were. Like if you're an objective Lions fan, you should say, well, two years ago they had all this fourth quarter comebacks, and they probably shouldn't have made the playoff. Like It was tough to duplicate what they did in 2016, which is why they didn't last year. Maybe they won all those games because they put the ball in Stafford's hand. You've got Golden Tate, Marvin Jones, Theo Riddick, one of the best pass-catching pass running backs coming out of the backfield Mm -hmm. so is detroit the worst team in the north before the lions fans yell at you yeah all right lions fans go find sam at pff underscore sam quick break guys to tell you about our friends over at my bookie just want to let you know that i use my bookie we've been using it over here at pff so that's why we're recommending it and it's not just about who's going to win but if you think you know go check out my bookie it's about who but also where mybookie.ag remember that's why, uh, you know, we've been internally talking about this with George and Eric, who are make, helping us uh, make a lot of our picks here, Sam. So we go to my bookie, uh, put our little wager in at mybookie.ag, and uh, this is the best play to, place to do it. Lay down some cash and win big today. Do you have any uh, bets you're going to throw? I'm going to hold week? off till after week one because week one is always insane. So I'm not, I'm not risking the cold hard cash on week one. Week two. That's what I'm going. I like right. to, uh, yeah, I like to go against the week one overreactions because sometimes just a team playing at home versus playing on the road is like a massive difference, and the matchups change. Go with the week two overreaction. So I would recommend this service because that's this is what we use over here. I'm urging you to go to my bookie. You win and they pay. They have in-game live betting as well, the most rewarding player perks in the business. And for you fantasy guys out there, you can actually bet the over under on how many fantasy points a player will score in each game so join now and my bookie will match your deposit dollar for dollar when you use the promo code pff to activate it visit my bookie online today that's m-y-b-o-o-k-i-e and don't forget to use the promo code pff when creating your account to claim your bonus you play you win you get paid you're gonna get paid this year sam excellent can't wait check out your locks of the week over with pff elite it's all part of green line our new picks product, that thing's going to be... I can't wait to see the emails pouring in when people start to use the Green Line picks. Can we uh, w- we write it into the deal with Green Line that we get a cut of everybody's winnings? That's that how would we, be good. That's, how we, make, that's, that's how we make millions. That's our bonus money. Yeah. 
That'd be nice bonus money. Let's do that. Is it too late to change the terms and conditions? I'll call Neil. Sort that out. All right, NFC South. Let's go through the division quickly. Yes. Yeah, quickly. Uh, Falcons and Saints at the top. Mm-hmm. And I'll say, and I, I have less faith in the Panthers and Bucks. I think the Panthers may take a step forward this year. That North Turner offense with Cam Newton intrigues me. It wouldn't intrigue me with any other quarterback, but Cam Newton is the one guy I think that can make that offense function and actually be dangerous in today's NFL, particularly when you've finally gone to plan what F or whatever it is at this point and have decided that the best way of making Cam Newton good is to give him wide receivers that will get open. Um, which but are is, they there yet? DJ Moore is. It's one guy. That's one more than he's had before. Ugh. Look, are we at a point? Are we at a point where if you just if you just use common sense, <laughs> and if every year we're like, oh, maybe this is the year, Cam Newton in his scheme. Maybe if you're just trying to fit this guy in a scheme, like Jay Cutler. Jay Cutler had 17 offensive coordinators in 10 years, right? Sam Bradford, my boy, I defended him earlier. But if you're rolling through offensive coordinators and this is the perfect fit for you this year, it's Jay Cutler and Mike Martz, it's Sam Bradford and this guy, and you're doing this year after year after year, maybe it's the quarterback's fault. But if you, yes, all right, that's perfectly fair in a Jay Jay Cutler example, right? But you can point to the issues with Cam Newton oh, I know. that are different to the issue. Like, the issue with Jay Cutler is he couldn't tell what he was going to do from one second to the next. No, right? I know. Cam's, Cam's better insane. than Jay, just so we know. With Cam Newton, there's a very specific problem, which is he's not an accurate quarterback, particularly on the underneath stuff. The stuff that's easy, he misses, and he misses high more than anybody else, right? So what do you do about that? They've got, like, they've got at least two different ways of dealing with that at the moment. The first one was to surround him with six foot five guys he couldn't possibly overthrow. But it turns out that a six foot five guy really doesn't have that much of an additional wingspan over a six foot guy. It's not moving the needle in terms of a guy who's airmailing at three feet over his head. Um, so that didn't fix it. The other problem with that is that six foot five guys don't get open because they all weigh two hundred and fifty pounds, and that's not going to get it done. And tight window throws just so low that percentage. Disaster. Options. Kevin, the, the Kev, Kelvin Benjamin thing, mess. Next plan. Let's get. Christian McCaffrey, let's get Curtis Samuel. Let's turn this entire offense into creative and, and fancy dump offs to the running backs. And we'll get a whole bunch of like plus receivers. And then Cam Newton's numbers underneath are going to go through the roof because they'll be wide open. Yes, but he's inaccurate at the stuff underneath. So what you're doing there is basically just asking him to do more of the thing that he's bad at. That inherently is a bad idea. But you still, you still need some of that, though. So the numbers went up a little bit, but he still was worse overall because yeah. you didn't do what you're supposed to be doing. Option three is what does he do well? He typically does very well at the intermediate and the deep level. He can do special things there that nobody else can do. So let's give him receivers that will get open at that range and just give him a bigger target to aim at. Not, not actually try and give the guy a bigger wingspan to catch it, but give him a bigger bucket to aim into so that it doesn't really matter if he's off target a bit because the guy has time to adjust and, and make a move because the DB isn't all over. The study so we've done with plan. accuracy, the study we've done with accuracy is if guys are open, and even if it's a little uncatchable, you know, catchable, but a little bit off target, that's still, there's still a ton of value there. It's just about getting higher percentage. So hopefully this is, the, this is the game plan that will finally play to Cam Newton's strengths. That doesn't mean he's going to go back to being an MVP right out of the gate, but it means he should be better, right? And you've still got some of those talented playmakers – like Christian McCaffrey that you brought in for an ill-advised you know, game plan, he still becomes really valuable. Plus, in the preseason, he's been running a lot more like college Christian McCaffrey between the tackles, yards after contact. He hasn't just been a receiving weapon. He's, he's been a workhorse, too, in this preseason. Offensive line's a big question mark. Whether Matt Khalil's healthy or not at left tackle, there's a question. Darrell Williams banged up at right tackle. That's an issue, and I think pass rush is an issue. This was a this was a theme as we went through this offseason. Pass rushes yeah. around the league may be questionable. Julius Peppers, Mario Addison joining K1 short. Some question marks there. Can the Saints duplicate what they did last season? Defense took a big step forward. Running game. Drew Brees still playing well. Saints look like they're ready to duplicate that at least. Yeah, I, it's, it's always tough to know if any of these NFC teams are going to duplicate what they did last year just because, again, the NFC is so tough, but they should be good again. There's no reason they shouldn't be, right? They've got weapons. Michael Thomas is still there. Ted Ginn has come back over, and you know Drew Brees is well capable of hitting a guy deep down the field when he's wide open. The offensive line is a pretty good-looking unit. The running backs are good even if Mark Ingram is going to miss time. Because um, they have Boston Scott. Hell yeah. 
on the defense is in good shape. Like it's a much better shape than it's been for a while. They're starting to fix the problem issues. They're getting some depth on the defensive line. They're getting talented players in that secondary. Yeah, I think they're going to be good. Yeah, so the Saints, I think, competing right there with the Atlanta Falcons, a team that all of our numbers point to them being very good, much like they were last year. I mean, we're talking about a team that was really a few plays away uh, from a lot more wins than they had, including a whole bunch of unlucky interceptions from Matt Ryan. Uh, Julio Jones now has Muhammad Sanu and Calvin Ridley. You know, and when they were really good in 2016, it was the, you know, uh, Taylor Gabriel there as that kind of number two, three option. Ridley can easily fix, uh, fill that role. Uh, probably have to call some better plays. They don't have Kyle Shanahan again for year two. Uh, but the defense continues to get better as well. They have slowly gotten better and better every single year defensively. Do you like the Falcons over the Saints as favorites, or you just have one and one A? Yeah, pretty much one and one A, I think. These are both two very good teams. They both also have good offensive lines, which I think is a trend with these um, most of the good teams that we're talking about, with the exception of the Vikings. Uh, most of these teams have good offensive lines, which just right. makes everything easier. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't need to have a fantastic offensive line, but if you just don't have a problem up front, it's way it's it's easier. The quarterback has his life is easier, the running back has holes to go through. It's just better. So the Falcons have a good offensive line. Their only problem spot over the past few years has been a right guard. Still might be an issue, but that's four out of five good spots. You can paper over one crack. Um, like I said, the defense has been heading in the right direction. Their coverage in particular, I think, is in really good shape. Yeah, I think those two teams are 1-1-A one one somewhere in this division. Drew Brees and Matt Ryan, from a grading standpoint, uh, almost identical when you stack up the last few years. Uh, and then the Tampa Bay Bucks, another one of those teams. I want to use the same narrative. Literally for identical. If you stack up the last four years, four years, yeah, perfect. See, very similar. We we put them next to each other in the PFF uh, fifty to make a point. They were tough to separate. And then you've got the Bucks. My narrative on them every single year: improved team, but it might not show in the record. I mean, we talked a lot this offseason about their improved defensive line. JPP coming down off the edge. Uh, you know, Vinny Curry as this movable. Uh, pass rusher, a guy that you can move around, play multiple gaps. Noah Spence becoming just a pass rush specialist. They draft Vita Vea. They're improved in a pretty yeah. key area. That defensive front should be so much better than it was a year ago. Is, is this the year, though, Jameis? Is this, is this when it happens? I mean, you can ask me for the next 10 years. It's still... It's always going to be yes. It took Carson Palmer until like his 13th year. He had two... Carson Palmer had 2005 and 2013. Does uh, it still count as being right if you just say yes every year and then on like the 13th year you I'm get not trying to be it. right. I'm just saying he has a profile that in a given year, he'll be really good. And I'm if you just, look at what he did in the preseason, he was dominant in the preseason. He looked ridiculous. That's what he can do. <laughs> That's why I'm asking. Is this 200 the, yards, second quarters. I don't know. Is this the year? Look... Here's the thing. When, when Tom Brady was suspended a couple of years ago, that was kind of like uncharted territory. Think about the position of quarterback in a suspension where you can't even talk to your teammates. You can't even text them, and you just roll into practice, and then you have to go play. Uh -huh. And then Brady – so Brady did that. Like, quarterbacks aren't normally suspended. Winston has to do that, go through this suspension. You know, all the timing that you have to work on with your receivers, and that's a tough thing to do. You just compare Jameis Winston to Tom Brady. I'm saying they're the only two quarterbacks I know that have been suspended and have to come back and, and play a game. That's going to be challenging. That's going to perhaps – now, Brady had the best year of his career after he did that. That's what I'm saying. So maybe, maybe it will work. I'm just saying that was an opportunity for you there to join me in the, uh, in the reclaim the comparison thing. Yeah, James, Jameis Winston is Tom Brady. Comparing Jameis no. Winston to Tom Brady. I'm comparing their suspensions. not the same as saying they're the same. They're, it's not a, the same as equating them. Reclaim the comparison, Steve. Do it. Join, mm -hmm. uh, join me. Comparing their situations. Um, I think their Tampa Bay's hopes will depend on Vernon Hargraves continuing his progression, whether they keep him in the slot or let him just develop outside. Carlton Davis perhaps claiming one of those outside spots at some point, their second-round pick. Really love what MJ Stewart is in the back, uh, defensive backfield as a guy that plays slot, covers tight ends. So I like the pieces they've had added in the secondary and last year what i was saying is i liked all the pieces that they added around Jameis, between mike you know with mike evans and deshaun jackson chris godwin was added uh, oj howard cameron braid at tight end i mean they're they're strong in some key places but still weak in a few others yeah i mean this is a team that could be good but it needs a lot to fall in the right place that offensive line hasn't been playing well they've they've actually invested a reasonable amount in it i just don't know if they've done it well yeah. Um, Donovan Smith at left tackle is still a, it's, it's bad. 
still it's not bad. good. Um, Ali Marpet at left guard, I think, is okay. I think he's a better center than he is a guard. They drove all of the money up to Ryan Jensen's hotel room and got him to sign. And he's shown games where that looks wise, and then he's shown games where it looks like the worst move anybody's made ever. So I don't know what he's going to shake out to be yet, but they kind of need him to be good given what they did. Uh, and then right guard, question mark, right tackle, good situation. So that offensive line, it's, it's kind of like the, you can envision a scenario where that offensive line is good, but equally you can envisage a scenario where it's terrible with like one bright spot on it. And that might make the difference in this year. Their offensive Seriously. line and their secondary. So you go from the other, you know, two other teams in the division where you're talking about good offensive lines, really no question marks, to a team where they could be good or they could be bad on the offensive line. And that, like, when, when everything else is kind of equal and everybody's good, that's your differentiator, right? And if they end up good, I think that pushes the Panthers to fourth in the division. I could buy that. Panthers hater over here. All right, let's go to the NFC East. Earlier you talked about the New York Giants perhaps being the worst team in the NFC. Explain yourself, Sam. Yeah, I mean, they're not good. But like, you know, they drafted a running back two overall rather than, you know, getting themselves a future franchise quarterback. So instead, Eli Manning is going to have to man this thing with now the running back in the backfield. Saquon Barkley is going to have to raise, elevate this entire offense. It's Eli Manning. They've got some weapons, right? It's Eli Manning, Sterling Shepard, Odell Beckham Jr., the richest wide receiver in the game. Evan Engram, I don't think, was that good last year, but there's talent there as a receiver, so we could see him actually do some things. Yeah, as a receiver, I like, yeah, it's a good combo there. The offensive line needs to get dramatically better. Nate Solder should upgrade left tackle significantly. Will Hernandez, I think, as a rookie, will upgrade left guard significantly. The other three spots, though, are big question marks. Big questions there. I mean, the pass game as a whole, because you had Saquon in there, yeah. as a pass game threat with Evan Ingram and those guys, I mean, that's, that's pretty nice. You still have Eli at the helm, who has not been – above, what, a top 20, 25 quarterback the last three years now. Which he should be this year, right? Between adding weapons, between getting a bit better on the offensive line, adding Pat Shermer, who coaxed career years out of multiple players at the Vikings, he's in a better situation, right? So you would expect him to be better this year. It should be a better situation. I've got more concerns about the defense right now, though. They've got a different defensive scheme. We talked about JPP moving on, and while JPP is not a great pass rusher, he's just this really good overall end, really good run defender – He's easily the best. I mean, him. Uh, Olivier Vernon's the best pass rusher on this team, and then it's J- JPP by a mile if he was still there, right? Well, I mean, Olivier, there's no one else. Yeah. And Olivier Vernon is now basically their only pass rusher on this team. Right. Which is asking a lot now for a guy to be the sole source of pass rush. Plus, the back end is hardly watertight either. Eli Apple is still their starting corner. That hasn't gone well in recent memory. Um, they, for some reason, got rid of both their free safeties that were playing okay, which is odd. Yeah, I mean, least. what's the new scheme going to do for Landon Collins? He was in such a good spot in their yeah. old scheme, the way he played. Will they be able to duplicate that? Because he's a defensive player of the year type of candidate uh, in the right role, in the wrong role, not so much. Alec Ogletree is now in the middle. He hasn't been great that, for the Rams. That preseason has just painted a giant bullseye on yeah. Alec Ogletree in terms of offensive coordinators. In consecutive weeks, he was completely eviscerated by David and Joku running down the seam. And I forget who the running back was. Was it who was it? Theo. Theoretic. Theoretic. Yeah. Theoretic completely destroyed him in coverage as well. So running backs, tight ends, basically the players you now need linebackers to be able to cover. There was giant signs all over preseason that he cannot come close to running with those guys. Like if I was an offensive coordinator rolling into a game against the Giants, almost everything I ran would be targeting the the, the linebacker group. Here's the weirdest statement, right? The Giants will have a good season if Eli Manning has a season like Case Keenum last year. How's that? Okay. I, I mean, mean th- that's what we're looking at. If, except if, the defense isn't nearly as good as the Oh, I, I get it. But I'm saying Shermer, if Shermer gets a Case Keenum season out of Eli Manning, they'll at least, you know, compete a little bit. If Shermer gets an, a Case Keenum season out of Eli Manning, this Giants roster will win seven games. Oh, boy. So we don't think it's looking good. Can you believe that Davis Webb, by the way, got beat out by the trick shot quarterback? Yes. You can? Davis Webb's very inaccurate. Trick shot quarterback's accurate. Davis Webb is very inaccurate and, okay, LOL at the whole narrative that they passed on Sam Darnold because they secretly like what they, lo- what they have in Davis Webb. You actually you, you just said LOL. I know. That's terrible. I know. That was really bad. Yeah. I find myself for that. 
All right, Super Bowl champs, Philadelphia Eagles. Can anybody beat them in the NFC East? Even with, with I, I love saying how Nick Foles, uh, how are they going to win with Nick Foles after they just won the Super Bowl, but we still have this like track record of it's a big question mark. Well, Nick, I mean, I, I don't think anybody has any earthly idea what you're going to get out of Nick Foles before any given game, right? He can be anything from Super Bowl MVP and the best player on the field in two consecutive games, the two hardest games of the year. NFC Championship and Super Bowl. Yep. He was the best player on the field both games, yep. right? So you can get that, and then you can go to playing preseason backups and looking like a disaster. Like you did this year. Yeah. And I, I don't know that you are in any position to know what you're going to get heading into any given game. He can be anywhere on the spectrum. He might be the single most high-variance quarterback in the entire NFL, which is amazing. The good news for the Eagles is I don't think it really matters. I don't know that anyone in the NFC East is going to be close enough for them that they can't afford to chuck a couple of games away at the start of the season without Carson Wentz. So even if they wheel him out there, Nick Foles has like the worst two games known to humanity. They lose comfortably. It's not going to matter, right? The Eagles are still too good. The other thing about it is that that Eagles defense may be good enough to carry him over two games anyway, yeah. like even if he does play that badly. Yeah, so that the pass rush is rolling seven deep. It's the Absurd. best pass rush in the NFL. When Jason Peters is healthy at left tackle, we've got them ranked as our best offensive line. When Alshon Jeffrey's healthy and out there with Mike Wallace, Nelson Aguilar, Mac Hollins, you just you have enough there. I mean, you've got different style receivers that work well. And then the mismatches that they can create at tight end. That's the key. Zach Ertz and now Dallas Goddard, the rookie second rounder, once he starts to get comfortable. I mean, this is a Super Bowl roster that is just taking wherever they could be deficient and just reloading new guys. And like we said before with the Bears and the Chiefs, this style of offense runs with a lot of two tight end sets. So that receiving core, again, doesn't look amazing. Alshon Jeffrey's good. Nelson Aguilar in the slot is good. Mike Wallace is not. But Torrey Smith last year wasn't either. But the key is where most teams need that third receiver, the Eagles don't because they've got these two tight end weapons. So the two tight and end. And running backs, too. I mean, yeah. Corey Clement. What they've done with him, but and while Darren most Sproles. you know, while most teams are running with this um, three receiver package, the Eagles run more with this two tight end package. So it doesn't right. really matter if the third guy as a receiver is bad; they just need one outside guy, one slot guy, and then these two tight end mismatch problems, which so far in preseason have looked devastating. Yeah, and head coach Doug Peterson has talked quite a bit about how that's that's what you do in the NFL; you create mismatches with tight end. So, mm -hmm. liking what they're doing, we've talked about it all off season. Big question mark: slot corner. Patrick Robinson out after his career year. Sidney Jones perhaps taking that spot. Let's, you know, that's kind of what I'll be. I'll be watching the Eagles slot corner next Thursday night. He's looked good Thursday in night. preseason so yeah. far, Sidney Jones. People forget this guy was the number one corner on most people's draft boards before he went down hurt in a freak preseason or pre-draft process um, injury, workout injury. So he's been covering the slot for them this preseason, like 50% completion rate. That's a really good number for a slot guy. He looks legit. Yep, and not your traditional – scouting report for a slot guy Not he looks guy. like looks like more of a, an outside type of corner let's go to dallas um we have you know it's kind of a what, what big question mark year for for Dak prescott after completely exceeding expectations as a rookie settling back into much more average of a season last year but with the caveat that he did not have tyron smith and he had a couple games where he literally just had no shot when yep. Chaz green is protecting his blind side at left tackle um Chaz cut, by the way. Cut day. Uh, Chaz did get cut for not blocking other humans. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about other. I don't. We talked about other teams being good at the receiver position and in the pass game. So many question marks here with Alan Hearns, Terrence Williams, Cole Beasley, Michael Gallup. As much as we love Gallup and all that stuff, you just don't. They need all those guys to kind of work well together and fill different roles. Question marks at tight end with no, you know, eight yard out. Jason Witten, <laughs> security blanket, eight yard curl, eight yard out. Uh, Zeke Elliott back and healthy should help but this is another one of those teams where people the perception is well they need to run the ball and that's what's gonna save them and everything where I'm still like man I want I want Dak to be that 35 40 pass a game carry my team guy yeah I mean the big question marks for them are what happens with the Travis Frederick thing um, you know this medical condition this syndrome he has that we don't know how long it's gonna keep him out for it could be yep. a couple of weeks could be all season if they go from him to Joe Looney all year on the offensive line, that's a significant downgrade, and it gives them two potential weak spots right next to each other with the way Connor Williams has struggled in preseason. Now, maybe that's just preseason. Williams bounces back and plays like a really good player, but equally, that could be two holes in that offensive line. I actually don't think the receiving core will be bad. 
I think those guys could work together quite well as a unit. It's just very unproven and not flashy. I think it could actually be effective, though. Um, and then the defense becomes really interesting because it's this collection of young players. Um, we've had some standout performances last year. Demarcus Lawrence, the one real kind of wild card in that whole group is the return of Randy Gregory from yes. nowhere. Agreed. Um, who has looked really good when he's been on the field, but one, can you rely on him being on the field for any extended period of time? And two, it's stupidly small sample sizes. Yeah, I mean, Demarcus Lawrence, if he can repeat what he did last year, he was incredible. Tyrone Crawford, solid. But if Randy Gregory looks as explosive as he did during the preseason, and you have Tarko Charlton, who was a late bloomer at Michigan, I mean, that's a pretty good collection of edges at their best. I have major question marks about the defensive tackles. Yes. Malik Collins has been terrible the last couple of years. He's not even listed as a starter. You have Daniel Ross and Dayton Jones, Antoine Woods in there. A lot of guys who have not had success at the NFL level, mm-hmm. we'll say. Um, I'm very intrigued by the back seven. Wrote about it this offseason with Jalen Smith, Sean Lee, drafting Landon Va- Van Der Esch, and a lot of versatile players in the back in defensive backfield, Byron Jones, Xavier Woods, Cheetah Bay Awuzie, who I picked as our breakout player on the PFF NFL show on uh, your YouTube channel. Um, I, I feel like Dallas could be all over the map this season. A lot depends to me on Dak. Yeah. And if the secondary plays – to whatever my expectations are. All of these guys being versatile players that, that play really well. And young. I mean, all these that entire yes. secondary almost is very, very young. So again, anytime you're relying on a whole collection of young guys at the same time, there is the potential for that to go south quite quickly because there's this there's no kind of veteran presence just steadying the ship, stopping the whole thing, tipping over the edge. That's what I think that's what we said about the Raiders last year. Well, we said the Raiders secondary like two years from now might be good. You had Carl Joseph, Gary and Conley at the time. You had Melon Fonwu before they released him. The Raiders thing always like. felt like it might not come together at the right time. Like yeah, you was said kind that. Of, there was this half mix of veterans and young guys, and it just felt like it wouldn't overlap, which yeah. kind of looks like that's what's happened. Yeah, that was your take. I think you're right. It turns out I nailed it. All right, let's wrap up this marathon. Did we hit every team? Uh, With the Washington Redskins. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say this. This is going to be one of my favorite things to watch. Uh-oh. The the QB wins deal, Alex Smith. Al- so Alex Smith has been a winner everywhere he goes, oh, right? God. His last couple of years in San Francisco, his <laughs> style of taking care of the football. I do think there's something to his style, not turning the ball over, keeping his team in games. And perhaps when you pair that with what this Redskins defense could become this year, I think the Redskins could surprise. You're like Mr. High Variance when it comes to quarterbacks, and now here you go rolling in there for the poster child of game managers saying he just wins games. Well, I think there's a high end of game manager. It's not like, like the LSU game on last, that was on last night, and everybody's like, hey, Joe Burrow's managing the game as he goes 10 for 25 while the defense actually scores points for uh-huh. him. That's not game managing. But not turning the ball over and making a few plays when you need to. Like Alex Smith's always been the high end of a game manager. The thing with Alex Smith is can he replicate what he did a year ago, which is being your game manager but then adding the deep ball to his arsenal. No, if he does that. that turned him in. That went from being game manager that doesn't do me a lot of good to being actually, you know what, this is legit now because now yeah. we're a game manager and I can hurt you. I can be dangerous. And at any moment when you switch off, we can, we can throw up six points. That is key, right? Now, that's easier to do when you have Tyreek Hill on the outside and your entire thought process is looking up, looking over there and going, yeah, you know what? He's one-on-one out there. It's Tyreek Hill, Steve. He's one-on-one over there. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to throw it there. Throwing it deep. Yep. So that, you know, touchdown. Easy. Now, you don't have that. You've got Josh Doxson. You've got Jamison Crowdy. You've got Paul Richardson. None of those guys are running straight past DB on the outside one-on-one. I think he's going to throw a lot of passes to Crowder out of the slot. Or a lot of jump balls to Josh Doxson, no, where you Alex just heave Fitz it downfield. No, not going to throw jump balls. That's the thing. Well, he, they might not be intended as jump balls, but Josh yeah. Doxson only gets jump balls. Yeah, that's true. So, but that's your thing, right? You're going to look up and you say, do I have one-on-one? Am I going to hur- hurl it downfield? Because if he can't keep that in his arsenal, I don't think he's high-end game manager. I think he's just game manager. Yeah, I mean, if he duplicates what he did last year, I think he was the sixth most valuable quarterback per our numbers, then the Redskins are a contender in the NFC. If you have a quarterback that's say from 15th to 6th, you know, you're, you're in every game. I you're, think you're the more competing. fun thing on this team is the defense, yeah. right? That defensive front, Jonathan Allen, one spot, looked fantastic before going down hurt. Say your guy's name. <laughs> We've got some players in here. We've got Deron Payne, their first-round pick this year. Then 
Then Here comes. we've got Matt Ioannidis on the other side. Your Fifth boy. round pick at a Temple back in 2016. Those three can all cause some havoc inside. Hey, look, Ziggy Hood's still collecting an NFL paycheck. How is that happening? They even that. found a guy to stop him playing nose tackle, and he's still on the roster. He's got experience. He, he does have experience. He has experience. He can uh, yeah. tell you all of the things not to do better than anybody else on the defensive Absolutely. line of the NFL. When we talk about pass rush, though, Deron Payne may be pushing the middle a little bit. Allen and Idonitis, like you said, and then just the consistency that is Ryan Kerrigan off the edge. Preston, let's say this combination of Preston Smith and maybe Ryan Anderson mm-hmm. on the other edge. Pernell McPhee, if he could just relive a little bit of his glory years. You know who else is still on the combo. team? Who? Anthony Lanier. Oh, yeah. My, uh, oh, my, one, my one play scout guy from uh, the Redskins training camp a couple Jeez. years back. He's still there. I could hear about this for years. I'm just saying. You saw one good play of his at training camp. Well, one yeah, good we drill, let's say. A few plays in there. Good drill. So, and, of course, Adrian Peterson at running back. Yeah. That's not that. He went out and had a really good game, like the second after we said that was a completely inconsequential signing. Yeah. It's still inconsequential. That was kind of annoying. That's all right. It still is. It doesn't matter how well he plays. It's, it's going to be all about Alex Smith. Concerns in the secondary opposite. Josh Norman, perhaps. Not Quentin Dunbar. Oppos- not just opposite Josh Norman. And at safety. Concerns at with Josh Norman. With Concerns Josh Norman surrounding well. Josh Norman. Did you see the play where Cortland Sutton almost fell over out of his off his release from the line, still breezed past Josh Norman, then was able to stop and like win a jump ball over him? He is old. Old and apparently not old. very fast. Well, he's his own corner, Sam. I'm just saying, that level of speed is concerning. There's concerns with Monte Nicholson maybe duplicating what he did last year. I think DJ Swearinger is a, just a roll of the dice every single year we've seen really bad we've seen really good with Swearinger Quentin Dunbar has had his ups and downs so some questions in the Senate secondary for the Redskins I think they need all of those pass rushers to hit to just protect that secondary a little bit want a random hot take prediction yeah Greg Stroman is going to be starting for them by the end of the year there you go passer seventh rating of pick. like 18 something I've year. seen yeah passer uh, seventh round pick at Virginia Tech uh, I thought he was a really good corner he's been playing well in preseason there's enough question marks about those Washington corners that at some point I think he's going to be in the lineup. The question is over Josh Norman, over Quentin Dunbar. Over no, I'm Fabian not getting too Monroe. specific here, Steve. I'm just saying okay, keep he's going to be starting. Is that it? Yeah, Set. we're done. We did it. We made it, guys. There's your NFC season preview. Go check out the AFC preview as well and stick with us all year over here at the PFF NFL podcast. We'll chat again, what, just before or just after Thursday Night Football probably. We'll give you guys a little week one preview later in the week.